Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. baby raccoon. He's used to being fed and talked to and held and admired. He's not afraid of people. Randy was brought to the Squam Lake Science Center after his mother was run over by a car. Most raccoons live in the woods. They live in hollow trees or in logs or in dens. Sometimes they live in homes that have been left by other animals. Skunks maybe or foxes. Raccoons look for their own food. They use their handy hands to pick up their food. They climb from branch to branch with strong grasping feet. Raccoons try to stay away from other animals who would do them harm. Randy is easy to handle, but you really shouldn't try to pick up a raccoon in the woods. It might be so frightened that it would use its sharp teeth and sharp claws on you in order to get away. When Randy was brought here, he was so tiny that his eyes hadn't even opened yet. Many animals are born with their eyes closed, you know. Randy had his eyes closed, he was hungry, and he was crying for his mother. The father raccoon wasn't run over. Why didn't the father raccoon take care of the babies then? The father raccoon doesn't take care of baby raccoons, or kits as they are called. A father raccoon leaves as soon as the kits are born. Mother raccoons take care of their babies. Normally, a baby raccoon gets its milk from its mother's body. Because Randy's mother had been killed, it wasn't easy to keep Randy alive. It's a good thing baby raccoons are born knowing how to suck. Because Randy could suck, the people here at the Squam Lake Science Center, there you go, we're able to keep Randy alive at first by giving him his milk through a doll's nursing bottle. Oh, what a hungry little fellow you are. That's why you were crying. And the people here will keep doing this until Randy is big enough and old enough to be able to feed himself other things besides milk. Naturalists tell us that raccoon and deer and other animals that feed their babies milk belong to a group of animals called mammals. Mammal, that may be a new word to you. What is a mammal? How is a mammal different from fish and earthworms, turtles, snakes, and spiders, and some of the other animals that we've talked about before? Well, there are certain things that make a mammal a mammal. First, a mammal is a vertebrate. In other words, it has a backbone. Second, a mammal is covered with hair or fur. Third, a mammal nurses its young. And fourth, a mammal is warm-blooded. Now let's talk about these things one at a time and see what each of them means. Want a peach? This deer has a hard backbone. You can almost see it. It has a bony skeleton inside its body. So does a snake, and a frog, a fish, and a bird. But they are not mammals. So a backbone can't be the only thing that makes a mammal different from other animals, can it? A mammal has hair on its skin. The deer's hair is called fur. This hair, or fur, is what keeps the animal warm. Let's look at those other animals again. Do you see any animal with hair or fur on its skin? Shake your head, yes or no. No, amphibians don't have hair. 
Reptiles don't have hair either. Birds have what? Feathers. Fish have scales. What does this mean? Well, one way a mammal is different from other animals is mammals have hair. A mammal nurses its young. Just like this mother deer nursing its fawn, mammals feed their babies with milk through special parts of their bodies called mammary glands. Do snakes or toads or fish or birds or any of those other animals we just saw nurse their young? No, they don't. So there's another way mammals are different from other animals. They nurse their young. A mammal is warm-blooded. Remember we said that reptiles, fish, and amphibians are cold-blooded. That means that their bodies take on the temperature of the air or the water that's around them. When we say mammals are warm-blooded, we mean that the temperature inside their bodies usually does not change, no matter how warm or cold it is on the outside. But are mammals the only warm-blooded animals we know about? What about birds? Birds are warm-blooded, so being warm-blooded doesn't make mammals different from all other animals, does it? Let's see. What do we call an animal that has a backbone, has hair or fur on its skin, nurses its young, and is warm-blooded? You've got it, a mammal. And here's something else. Almost all mammals are born alive. That is, they are born from their mother's body. But we can't say that this one thing makes them different from all other animals. Why not? Because some snakes are born from their mother's body, and some fish are too. But almost all mammals are born alive. Where do we find mammals? Everywhere. And they come in all shapes and sizes. A mouse is a mammal. So is an elephant. Mammals are found all around us, on the ground, under the ground, in the trees, in the air. A bat has a special part to its body that no other mammal has. A bat has wings. Mammals are found underwater, too. For instance, dolphins are mammals, and they have the least hair of any mammal we've talked about. Dolphins have whiskers. Whiskers, you know, are hair. Here are some mammals that someone brought to the Science Center this morning. Three baby squirrels whose mother may have died. As you can see, they have their eyes closed and they have very little hair. But soon their eyes will open and their fur will grow and they'll be scampering around looking for food on their own. But for now, we have to take care of them in the nature hut. Many animals are mammals, and you already know quite a bit about them, especially if you have a dog or cat at home, or if you take care of gerbils or hamsters at school. And you watch mammals on TV, and some of you go to see them at the zoo, and you already know that they come in all shapes and sizes. I think you would say that each shape and size is just right for the way that animal lives and feeds. But do you always know a mammal when you see one? Let's take an animal walk and visit some of the animals at the Squam Lake Science Center. Every time you see a mammal, clap your hands like this, okay? All right, let's go. A robin. Is a robin a mammal? Hmm. What about a bear? What kind of animal is a caterpillar? Is it a mammal?
What do you think a porcupine is? And the opossum? You're doing well. Oh, look. Here's a grasshopper. Is a grasshopper a mammal? Peekaboo turtle. Are you a mammal? Kittens? Kittens in the woods. Are they mammals? There's a bee. How about a bee? And what about the baby fox? Is a salamander a mammal? What do you think? And what kind of animal is a baby beaver? I'll bet you know what kind of animal a fawn is. you. You really do know a mammal when you see one. And I'm sure you know a lot of things about the mammals we've already seen. But of all the mammals in the world, which one do you really know the most about? It's a very special mammal. It has a hard backbone, hair on its skin, it's nursed by its mother, and it is warm-blooded. It's the one you see every time you look in the mirror. It's you. See you next time. This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And now, read together with Walter Anderson. If you can watch me, then you have a TV. If you have a TV, then you've probably seen a movie called The Wizard of Oz. What you might not know is that this great adventure story began in a book. The wonderful Wizard of Oz has all your favorite characters, Dorothy, the Scarecrow, and the Wizard himself. But just wait until you meet the Yellow Winkies or the Terrible Kaladars. There's a yellow brick road in this book, too. But there's also the country of the quadlings. You see, Dorothy's adventure doesn't end when she meets the wizard. And it's a lot harder to find homes. Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on up close and natural. Your education station viewers supported WSKG TV, Binghamton. is frozen over now and covered with snow. It's a cold day, but I'm not cold. Exercise keeps me warm. Besides, I'm dressed for the cold winter weather. And I have an apple to eat in case I need more energy. But what about the animals? What do they do when it gets cold? How do they keep warm? 
How do they get enough to eat to keep them alive? What about bears, for instance? What do they do when the cold winter days come? Let's visit the bears at the Squam Lake Science Center and see what we can find out. I am standing on three feet of snow on the ramp where the visitors to Squam Lake stand in the summer to watch the bears. It's certainly not quiet like this then. A bear doesn't eat all winter, so before these bears go to sleep, they need to eat enough food to last them until spring. Squirrels and mice and other animals store away seeds and nuts for their winter meals. But bears live on the fat they have built up under their own skin by eating a lot during the summer and fall. Bears are mammals that belong to a group of meat-eating animals called carn... carnivores. Good. All carnivores have strong teeth and sharp claws. Bears are meat-eating animals, but they also eat berries, ants, honey, roots, fish, tree bark, green plants, grubs, mice, grasshoppers, and other things like that. The bears who live at the Squam Lake Science Center don't have to hunt for their own food, as bears in the wild do. Back in the fall, the bears at the Science Center dug this den using their paws with their long hooked nails. Then they pushed dry leaves into it and made themselves a bed. This is where they spend most of the winter. In the spring, when the female bear comes out of the den, she may have two baby bears with her. Baby bears, called cubs, are usually born every other year during the mother bear's winter sleep. A mother bear can be dangerous when she has her cubs with her. She is afraid some other animal will do them harm. She is cross to the cubs, too, if they don't mind her. Mother bears seem to know bears have a lot to learn to stay alive. Bears are fun to look at, but always look at them from a distance. It's never a good idea to get too close to any wild animal, especially carnivores. They have no way of knowing that you aren't going to hurt them, but they could become frightened and hurt you. Some animals sleep all winter. Most amphibians and some insects do. The American black bear is one of several animals that get through the cold weather by sleeping at least part of the winter. One of the Squam Lake bears is asleep in her den right now. But Bert the bear has come out of his den for a while. The American black bear isn't the only mammal that sleeps part of the winter. Here are some others. Say their names with me if you can. There's the chipmunk, woodchuck, raccoon, squirrel, and some bats. But of all mammals that sleep in the winter, the woodchuck and some bats are true hibernators. They stay in deep sleep all winter. Remember what happens when animals hibernate. Their temperature falls, their heartbeat slows down, and if you saw them asleep, you might think they were dead. Chipmunks, raccoons, skunks, and bears wake up from time to time. And all of them, except the bear, look for something to eat. A bear doesn't eat all winter, but like some others, may come out to sit in the sun on a warm winter's day what are some other things that animals do to stay alive in the winter? Yes, some just leave. They migrate. Many birds go away to a warmer climate in the fall and come back in the spring. Some butterflies, bats, and fish migrate too. As soon as it starts to get cold, they move to a climate where they can find food and warmth. Now I'd like you to meet Snowy Owl who lives here at Squam Lake Science Center. He came here from a much colder climate, the Arctic, when his food got scarce. His food there was hares and lemmings, little mouse-like animals. Here at the center, his food is mice and rabbits and other small animals. 
Snowy owls, with their sharp beaks and their strong claws, are powerful predators. Most owls nest in trees and hunt in the nighttime. But snowy owls and a few others nest on the ground and hunt in the daytime. Let's see. So far, we've said that some animals survive the winter by hibernating, and some animals survive by migrating. What are some other things that help animals get through the cold? Well, what have I done? What do you do? You put on more clothing. Many animals are able to keep warm because as soon as the weather starts to get cooler, they grow a thicker layer of fur or feathers. And some animals shed their summer coats and grow white ones. That's what the snowshoe hare does. A snowshoe hare is a brown animal in the summer and a white one in the winter. This hare is changing colors. It's between its brown summer coat and its white winter one. The change usually takes about 10 weeks. Its feet and ears and the front of its head usually turn white before its back does. The snowshoe hare gets its name from the fact that it grows long hairs between the toes on its back feet. Just like snowshoes, the hind feet of the snowshoe hare keep it from sinking into the snow. In the winter, the hare feeds on buds, twigs, and the bark of trees and shrubs. Like its relative, the rabbit, the hare can use its speed to run from its predators. But some predators, like the snowy owl, use camouflage too. Snowy owl doesn't show up against the snow and may catch his enemy by surprise. These tracks that look like upside down hearts are the tracks of the white tailed deer. The deer at the Squam Lake Science Center are quite tame. They're used to having people around, as you can see. Just like deer in the wild, these deer grow heavy furry coats to keep them warm in the winter. Thick grayish hair grows in place of their brown summer hair. The top hairs are hollow and stiff. The hair underneath is soft and curly. Together, they trap warm air just like your heavy winter jacket does, so the deer's warm body heat doesn't escape into the cold air. But what about the deer in the wild? They have no special shelter where they can go when winter comes. What do they do? Well, many deer gather together and make a herd. The herd huddle together under the trees in places where the snow makes a thick blanket over the lower branches. As they walk around, they tramp down the snow the place they make is called a yard. If they eat up all the food in their yard, they move on to other places where there is food and water. However, in really bad weather, when the snow is very deep, they are not able to move far, and sometimes they starve to death. Every winter, not only deer, but also rabbits, squirrels, raccoons, and other animals freeze or starve to death because they cannot find enough berries, seeds, nuts, grass, or tender tree branches to eat. Whether we like to think about it or not, death is natural and necessary. Remember, we once said that one of the differences between living things and non-living things is that living things must die. Suppose this weren't true. Suppose all the animals on Earth lived forever. Soon the whole world would be so filled with mice, rabbits, skunks, bears, raccoons, snakes, chipmunks, and people, there would not be enough food for them or enough places for them all to live. So it is natural and important that animals die. I'm talking about individual animals. But it's not good when all the animals in an area die or are forced out all at the same time. This is what happens when people build houses, factories, shopping centers, and roads in the fields and forests where animals live. The opossum needs a place to sleep during the cold winter months. 
It needs a hollow tree or a wood pile. Take these places away and it may not be able to survive. It just can't live in a place that has no food for it, like a parking lot. You may feel that you would like to help animals, but actually most animals take care of themselves very well, so long as their homes aren't destroyed. So an important thing you can do for them is try to see to it that their shelters aren't destroyed. Now, let's see what we've talked about today. Some animals survive the winter by, what do we call it when they move away to a warmer climate? Migrating, good. Some animals survive by hibernating, that's right. Others survive by growing a thicker layer of fur or feathers. Bears eat a lot before they go into their long winter sleep in order to build up a thick layer of fat. The best thing you can do for animals in the winter or any time is see to it that nothing destroys their habitat. Fine. Well, that ends our winter visit to Squam Lake. See you next time. This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm Marshall Efron, and I'd like to explain to you how to make a light bulb and also show you how it works. First, you want to make one of these and be careful. Now, this here is the... Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. Your education station viewers supported WSKG TV, Binghamton. a busy time of year down here at the Squam Lake Science Center, especially down by the pond. Birds are back from where they spent the winter in warmer places and are building nests. Turtles and other animals have crawled up from out of the mud where they spent the winter at the bottom of the pond. Frogs are mating. That is, the female frog is laying her eggs in the water and the male frog is adding his sperm to them. Soon the adults will swim away and leave the eggs to hatch by themselves. They're not like mammals who care for their young. Hey, what have you got there? A bullfrog. How do you know it's a bullfrog? It's the only green colored frog that doesn't have lines on its back. Oh, is it a male frog or a female frog? I don't know. I know it's hard to tell, but there is a way. Look here. If the frog's eardrum, right here, is bigger than its eye, it's a male frog. If the eardrum is smaller, it's a female. Bigger, male, smaller, female. It's a male. 
Do you remember what kind of feet a frog has? Webbed feet, yes. A frog's feet look something like the flippers some of you wear when you go swimming. You use your flippers the same way the frog uses his feet. Do you want to see him jump? Sure, why not? Let's see what other pond animals we can find. Let's look from the boat. Take a look, see what you can find. crawfish or crawdad. People call them by different names. You know, we were lucky to find a crayfish in the daytime. Usually they spend most of the day in a burrow. What other animal does the crayfish remind you of? An animal maybe that you like to eat. Yes, a lobster. And has a hard outside skeleton like a lobster. It's good to eat like a lobster. And like a lobster, if it loses one of its legs, it can grow a new one. How many legs does it have? Can you count them? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. And it has ten legs, just like a lobster. Look at that pair of big eyes on top of his head. A crayfish can see a predator coming up behind it and get away fast. These front legs are strong. A crayfish uses them like your thumb and forefinger to seize its food and tear it apart. A crayfish is a scavenger. It feeds on dead animals. Crayfish can crawl around on the land or in the water, but they have to go back to the water to stay alive. Uh, what have we got here? A snail hiding in its shell. Most snails live in the sea or on land, but a few live in ponds. They crawl around under the water, scraping the tiny plants they live on with a tongue as rough as a nail file. Oh, it's hiding in its shell. I'd better put it back again. Look at that. It's a red-spotted newt swimming around in the water. Do you remember what group of animals frogs, toads, and salamanders belong to? Newts belong to that group, too. Do you remember the word for that group? Amphibian. That's terrific. There's a painted turtle going into the water to get some food. Turtles often look for aquatic animals to feed on. Aquatic, now that's a new word. Aquatic animals are animals that live in or near the water. A pond, like this one, is an aquatic habitat. Snakes, fish, frogs, newts, crayfish, and snails aren't the only animals that live in an aquatic habitat. Other animals live here, too. Let's see if we can discover some of them. One of the best ways to take a good look at pond life is by standing in it. Good heavens, what's happening over there? Is it raining? No, those aren't raindrops I see. It's hundreds of insects. Whirling, bobbing, striding, skating, hopping, leaping over the top of the water. They make the water look as if it's being rained on. How can insects move around on top of the water like that? Why don't they drown? Let's take a closer look. Look at that water strider and its shadow. Why doesn't the water strider sink? Well, water striders and whirligig bugs and many other insects are kept up on the surface of the water by their light weight 
and the shape of their bodies. But there's one more reason why these insects don't sink in the water. I'll tell you what it is and I'll show you how it works after we go back to the nature hut. But before we go, there's one more thing I'd like to show you. If I can catch some in my net. Those are minnows. You can find minnows in ponds and lakes everywhere, and in the ocean, too. Shake your head yes or no if you think minnows are baby fish. No, no, they're not. These minnows are as big as they're ever going to be. Now take a look and tell me whether you think minnows travel alone or in schools. In schools, good. We'll put our minnows back in the water. There you go. And before we go, let's take a jar of pond water along. I'll put it in the collecting jar, and we'll take a look at it when we get back to the nature hut. Jason, are you coming back to the nature hut with me? Oh, good. Maybe you can give me a hand with some of these things. Why don't you take the bucket, okay? Uh, I'll get the net. I guess that's it. All set? Let's go. So far, we've looked up close and we've talked about only a few of the animals down here at the pond. There are many, many more. And when we get to the nature hut, we'll look at another interesting animal I have in the collecting jar. Before we look at that animal, I want to show you something else. This is a sewing needle on the surface of the water. Why doesn't it sink? Do you see that the surface of the water holds up the needle? Well, in the same way, the surface of the water in the pond holds up the running, walking insects that we saw at the pond. Now, what about the other animals that I said we'd look at? the ones that I was collecting in the collecting jar at the pond. Well, you can look very closely at the water, but you can't see any animals, can you? They're there all right, but they're just too small to be seen with your eyes. How do you suppose we could see them? Let's look through the microscope. Okay, we'll do it. Let's take a drop of the pond water and put it under the microscope. See what we can see, okay? Look at that. That's a tiny animal called a paramecium. It's so small you can find many of them in a single drop of pond water. The paramecium is constantly searching for food to take into its own body. How is the paramecium able to do that? Well, no matter how big or small an animal is, it is usually adapted to do what it needs to do to stay alive. Adapted. That means fitted. For example, a frog's color helps it adapt, helps it stay alive. The bullfrog uses its color to hide from its predators by looking like what is around it. Do you remember what we call this special kind of coloring? Camouflage, yes. Camouflage is one kind of adaptation, one way animals are adapted to stay alive. A frog's tongue is another adaptation for catching insects. The frog's bug eyes and webbed feet are adaptations for seeing a predator and getting away from it fast. By the way, what about your adaptations? What special things does your body have that help you stay alive? Maybe you'd like to talk those over with your teacher. I wonder, could it be that your very best adaptation is your brain? What do you think? You know, not all the animals that visit the pond live there all the time. 
Some come to search for food, like these birds that eat the insects off the surface of the pond. Or raccoons who come searching for crayfish. Or dragonflies looking for other insects. Some even come just to get a drink. A pond is a very important place for all sorts of animals, even for us who come to fish or just to watch. See you next time. This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. From Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan, it's Read Together with Walter Anderson. Has someone very old ever told you a story he heard when he was very young? Fun, isn't it? That's what we call a folk tale. A folk tale is a story that people tell over and over again. Whenever you hear a folktale, you think of the people who began the story. There's a wonderful book called The People Could Fly. It's full of folktales first told by slaves early in our country's history. Many of the stories were brought over from Africa, but others were started right here in America. Some of the tales are funny, some scary, others sad, even magical. All of the things that make people tell these stories again and again. Find out why. Go to your local library and read that People Could Fly by Virginia Hamilton. Take mom or dad. Yeah. Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. Your education station, viewers supported WSKG TV, Binghamton. live all over the world. Some elephants live in the rainforest. Land tortoises live on faraway islands. White-tailed deer live in open woodlands. Lions live in grasslands. Crabs live in oceans. And of course, animals also live in places like the ones we visited here at Squam Lake Science Center. The forest, the pond, and the lake. All these places we've just mentioned are animal habitats, places where animals normally live and find food, grow, and make other animals like themselves. Today, we're going to visit two more animal habitats. Like the pond we saw in the last program, these two habitats will be aquatic habitats. Does anyone know what aquatic means? Water, yes. A wetland is an aquatic habitat. A wetland like this is called a marsh. Tall grasses grow in marshes. You see some cattails and other plants, but no trees. A marsh is a wetland that doesn't have any trees. I need waders on today for exploring wet places like these. Waders are very tall rubber boots. to explore a place like this, but never do it alone. Always take a grown-up with you. Oh, look! Here's a turtle. We saw one of these before. 
It looks like it has spots painted on it, remember? It's a painted turtle, right. Oh, do you hear that? It's the call of the red-winged blackbird. Red-winged blackbirds make their homes in the cattails and tall grasses. They come early in the spring from warmer places where they have spent the winter, and they build their nests here. Sometimes ducks lay their eggs and hatch their babies in the cattails too, and teach them to hide there if a marsh hawk or a short-eared owl flies over looking for a meal. It isn't always easy to see animals that live in the marsh because many of them stay out of sight most of the time. Many of them hide from their predators in the cattails and tall grass at the edge of the marsh. But if you're patient and quiet, you might see a heron fishing for its dinner. The heron is a good fisherman. It will stand without moving for a long time, watching with its sharp eyes for a fish to swim by. Then a stab with its long bill, and the fish is swallowed head first. Frogs, tadpoles, and mice make a good meal for a heron too. You're lucky if you get to see a heron feeding, but you won't have much trouble watching a duck standing on its head with its bottom in the air, feeding on plants and water weeds. Ducks often come to a marsh to feed. Two animals you will have no trouble finding near a marsh are mosquitoes and biting flies. Or maybe I should say, they'll have no trouble finding you. Anyway, Every animal that lives in a marsh, mosquitoes and other insects, are part of a food chain. What do I mean by that? What is a food chain? Well, mosquito larvae, or wigglers as they're sometimes called, feed on decaying plants. Small fish eat mosquito larvae. A frog eats small fish. And a heron eats the frog. The heron, the frog, the small fish, the mosquito larvae, and the decaying plant make a food chain. Many food chains start with plants. Some start with algae. Algae come in all shapes and sizes. One kind is the algae you see right here. The food chain can also start with other kinds of small plants, like this duckweed floating on the water. Because they have so many plants and animals, marshes have many, many food chains. That's why they're such important places. In fact, many animals depend on marshes and other woodlands for their very survival. Marshes come in different kinds and in different places. Some, like the ones along the coasts of our country, are saltwater marshes. Saltwater marsh, what does that mean? It means salt water, ocean water, covers part of the land. Saltwater marshes are the homes of many sea animals. Crabs, snails, tiny fish, and seabirds. Other marshes, like the one at Squam Lake Science Center, are partly covered with fresh water. Water from rivers and streams and rainwater. Does fresh water mean you can drink it? No, it just means it's not salty like the water that comes from the ocean. The largest marsh in the United States is the Florida Everglades, named the River of Grass by the Seminole Indians. Many interesting animals live in the Everglades, some of them quite different from the ones that live at Squam Lake Science Center. I wouldn't walk around there in my waders, would you? Another wetland we're going to visit here at Squam Lake is a swamp. Remember we said that a marsh is a wetland without trees, just grasses? Well, a swamp is a wetland with lots of woody plants and trees growing in it. Some woody plants and trees grow along the edge of the swamp, and some grow with their roots right in the water. Because a swamp has trees, some of the animals that live in a swamp are different from those that live in a marsh. There must be an owl around here someplace. Aha! There it is. It must be a barred owl. Those are sometimes called a swamp owl. 
How did I know I'd find an owl around here? This owl pellet gave me a clue. What's an owl pellet? Well, an owl has a very strange way of digesting its food. After killing an animal, it sometimes swallows it whole. It digests its prey in its stomach. But things like fur, bones, and feathers, it churns up into a tight ball or pellet, like this, and throws it up. This owl has eaten a furry animal, probably a mouse. What's that? You're right if you said it's a beaver lodge or a beaver home made of sticks. Let's take a closer look. Beaver have to cut down many trees in order to build their homes. Did anyone ever tell you that you were busy as a beaver? Then you must have been very busy because beaver are very busy animals, especially at this time of year when they're getting ready for winter. You know, the most important work any animal does is staying alive. A beaver's body is well adapted for what it has to do to stay alive. It has sharp, chisel-like teeth for cutting down the trees it needs to build a lodge. Handy front paws for carrying mud to waterproof the lodge to keep out the rain and snow. Strong webbed hind feet for swimming away fast from a predator. A broad tail for swimming or sitting up straight to cut down a tree. This beaver must think I'm a predator. Anyway, it isn't taking any chances. We can't see inside this beaver lodge. But if we could visit the Museum of Science in Boston or some other large museum, we might see a model of a beaver lodge. This is what it looks like inside. It's a very snug, protected place, and beaver parents take good care of their babies. By the time new babies are born, these half-grown young will be big enough to leave the lodge, find a mate, build their own lodges, and have babies of their own. That's the way it is with beavers, year after year. Well, there you have it. I think marshes and swamps are very interesting places. But it makes me feel sad to discover that some people don't think we need them. They think wetlands are just places where mosquitoes and biting flies grow. They think marshes and swamps should be used for other things. So they do this and this. Many of our best marshes are already gone. Who cares? Who needs them anyway? Animals do. Marshes are the beginning of many food chains. And ducks and geese and muskrat need them to find their food, to find places to raise their babies. And who else needs them? We do. We need marshes and swamps to explore and to enjoy. See you next time. This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Raton, New Mexico, the sun-baked land is finding new life through Operation Wilderness, a project undertaken by the Raton chapter of the FFA. Student activities included animal transplants, a mine waste reclamation project, a citywide cleanup, and the building of ski and handicapped nature trails. At the site of a former mine, they reworked the earth to curtail erosion and planted seeds to revegetate the dusty land. 
Their teacher, Ray Chalasky, believes the innovative project is healing the wounds of environment. Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. Your education station viewers supported WSKG TV, Binghamton. I mean by that? Do I mean that a fox is cute? Well, this fox certainly is cute, but that's not what I mean by cunning. What I mean is a fox is very smart at doing the things it needs to do to stay alive. It's good at hunting and catching the food it needs. Mice, rabbits, baby woodchucks, salamanders, frogs, grasshoppers, and many other animals. It's good at finding a home for itself when it's big enough to leave its parents. And it's clever in staying away from danger. A fox is not eaten by many other animals, although bobcats and wolves do prey on foxes in some parts of the country. Sometimes a fox is hunted with dogs for sport, and sometimes it is killed by angry farmers whose chickens it has stolen. Foxes are meat eaters. What do we call animals that eat mostly meat? Carnivores, yes, you remembered. A fox is a carnivore. Unfortunately for the farmer and the chickens, and sometimes the fox, chickens seem to be one of the fox's favorite foods. A fox is good at finding food and at finding a den or a burrow to live in, but it is especially good at getting away from its enemies. For example, a fox that is being chased by dogs will sometimes fool them by running in circles, walking along a stone wall, or swimming across a river. That way, the dogs lose the scent of the fox's footprints, and they give up. The fox seems to know many clever tricks to outfox its enemies. This fox doesn't need to find its own food. It is fed and cared for here at Squam Lake Science Center. That's why you see it wearing a halter. This little fox is a tame animal. Do you remember Randy the raccoon? Well, just like Randy, this little fox was found one day wandering around and crying. Nobody knows for sure what happened to its family. It was so young and so small that it had to be fed from a baby bottle. Hey, come here. But now it plays just as a puppy plays. It chases anything that moves and pounces on it. For a baby fox in the wild, this would be good practice for catching its own food. Baby foxes do play like puppies. Do you know why that doesn't surprise me? It's because foxes and dogs belong to the same animal family. A fox is a close relative of a dog. A fox plays like a puppy and does several other things that dogs do. What does a puppy do with a bone it doesn't want to eat right away? Buries it, yes. A fox does that with its food, too. Look at that. Our fox can't dig a deep enough hole for its bone, so it's covering it over with grass. When it gets big, this fox kit should live in the wild, as foxes do. But so far, it doesn't want to leave us. And we're glad it doesn't want to, because it hasn't yet learned how to hunt for itself. When it does, it will be let go. In the meantime, our little fox will continue to be fed and cared for here at the Squam Lake Science Center, as many other animals are. Now let's go take a look at another interesting animal that, like the fox, makes its home in the field. Most of you know what a field looks like. 
What are some of the other animals that live in the field at the Squam Lake Science Center? Ah, there's one over there. Do you know what it is? It's a woodchuck. A woodchuck is a rodent. Do you know these other rodents? Say their names if you do. Mouse. Beaver. Porcupine. Squirrel. Look at the woodchuck's body, especially look at its legs. Although a woodchuck can run quite fast, it can't run as fast as a fox and some other animals. Most of the time, a woodchuck waddles along close to the ground. But like the fox, it does have sharp claws with which it digs a home deep in the earth, or even climb trees if it has to, to avoid its enemies. The woodchuck's home has several rooms, including a room where it sleeps all winter on its bed of grass and leaves, and a room that is its toilet. A woodchuck is a true hibernator. That means it sleeps all winter without going out for food. How does it live all winter without eating? Well, it lives on the fat in its body that it built up by eating plants and vegetables all summer. Sometimes plants and vegetables from the farmer's garden. That is why a woodchuck is not a popular animal with many gardeners. But mostly, woodchucks eat wild grasses and weeds. When the weather gets colder, the woodchuck will crawl down into its hole, like this one, and it won't wake up until spring. A woodchuck has another name, groundhog. A woodchuck is sometimes called a groundhog. It is not a hog, of course, but it is a kind of squirrel, a big one at that. Have you ever heard of Groundhog Day? February 2nd every year is called Groundhog Day. Some people say that's the day the groundhog, or woodchuck, comes out of its burrow and looks for its own shadow. If it sees it, it goes back in its hole, because that means there will be six more weeks of winter. If it doesn't, it stays out, because spring has already arrived. Is that true? Well, true or not, it's fun to know something about an animal that has its own special day. A woodchuck has to stay close to its den because it can't run as fast as many of its predators do. It can't protect itself with sharp quills as a porcupine does or give off a bad smell as a skunk does. A skunk. Now there's another animal that isn't very popular with many people. A skunk raises its tail and sprays a liquid on animals that try to prey on it. This liquid not only smells bad, it burns the eyes of the predator. That seems to be the reason most animals let a skunk alone. Very hungry foxes and bobcats will attack it sometimes, and so will horned owls. But that may be because it is thought that horned owls have no sense of smell. Mona is a tame skunk that lives here at the Squam Lake Science Center. Mona has been descented, as most pet skunks are, that is, the glands that make the smell have been removed from her body. No, it doesn't hurt. In the winter, many skunks make dens of their own, but sometimes they move into a woodchuck's extra room. The woodchuck doesn't seem to mind. After all, it's asleep. There's another animal whose habitat is the forest that I sometimes see in this field, hunting for food. That's the opossum. Remember the animal that carries its babies in its pouch? Look at those eyes and teeth. Did you ever see so many teeth? The opossum has more teeth than any other mammal in North America. Notice it has five fingers and toes on each of its four paws. It has a thumb on its hind paws that helps it hold onto branches when it climbs a tree. Well now, so far we've only talked about mammals that live in or near the field. I hope you don't think that mammals are the only animals that live in the field. A field is the habitat for many birds and insects, too. Listen. You can find a kingbird in a field. The kingbird eats many insects that are found there. And it's the hunting ground of the kestrel 
a kind of hawk that used to be called a sparrow hawk. The kestrel is a fast flyer, and when it needs food, it swoops down into the field to catch a mouse or a grasshopper. A field is a good habitat for a kestrel because so many small animals, birds, and insects live there. To see its food far below in the grass, a kestrel needs sharp eyes. To swoop down on its prey, it needs strong wings. To grab its prey, it needs sharp talons. A kestrel's toenails are its talons. And what does it have for tearing its meat? Just look at that beak. A field is a good habitat for a kestrel. But let me ask you this. Is a field a good habitat for a mouse? You're right if you said yes, it is. That's because the field has so many things that mice eat to stay alive. Seeds, spiders, earthworms, and crickets. A field is also a habitat for thousands, maybe millions of insects. We find them on the ground. We find them in the grass. And we see them flying over the field. Now, let's see. Here are some questions about some of the things we learned today about this special habitat, the field. Are you ready? OK. A field is a good habitat for many mammals, birds, and insects. All right. A fox is good at outfoxing its predators, OK? A woodchuck is a rodent. Another name for a woodchuck is a groundhog. One more. A woodchuck sleeps all winter. So we say that it hibernates. Very good. Well, that ends our visit to the field today. See you next time. This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Have you ever sat down at a typewriter and wondered why the keys are laid out like that? Why should the E, a very handy letter, sit way up there on the second row? And that other useful letter, the A, who assigned it to its position? Well, you probably assume that some genius in the distant past figured out that this layout was the most efficient way to arrange the letters. And what did you know anyway? But if you still thought it was screwy, you were right. It is illogical. The modern typewriter keyboard is a gift of the inventor of the first modern typewriter, an American named Christopher Scholes. Around 1870, he made the earliest practical typewriter, and it was called the typewriter. Two words with a hyphen. His earlier version had the keyboard laid out alphabetically, but there was a big problem with this. If you practiced and got good at typing on it, you would go too fast for the machine and the keys would jam. So, Scholes came up with a keyboard which he designed to be hard to use, one that he thought no typist, no matter how good, could use at high speed. The most used letters were placed far apart from each other, and the layout favored the usually weaker left hand. He did something else as well. As an advertising gimmick, he put all the letters in typewriter in the top line. And this keyboard, known as the QWERTY keyboard for the first letters on the top line, is the one still overwhelmingly in use in the English-speaking world today. Now, you'd think that as typewriters improved, someone at some point would have stopped this silliness and invented a more efficient keyboard. Actually, many people did. And a man named August Dvorak came out with one of the best in 1936. On it, 
a typist's fingers must travel only one sixteenth as far in an average day. On the Dvorak keyboard, you can type 3,000 words on the home row. On the traditional keyboard, you can type 120. Instructional television. Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explores fields and forests at Squam Lake Science Center in New Hampshire on Up Close and Natural. WSKG-TV, Binghamton. Like Science Center, we've seen many animals and visited many of their habitats. We've been out in the field and seen a kestrel and a woodchuck and many insects that live there. We've been to a swamp and seen a beaver lodge and to the marsh and seen ducks. We've been down to the pond and seen frogs, and to the lake where we saw a sunfish. We've been into the forest in winter and seen deer and squirrels. And we've looked through a microscope and seen animals we couldn't see by looking just with our eyes. Do you know what I'd like? I'd like it very much if someday you could come to the Squam Lake Science Center and see some of the animals we've talked about. Maybe someday you will. But if you can't, then some of you might be able to go to a zoo or a nature center near your home and get acquainted with the animals that live there. You might see a big sea turtle like this one. It moves the same way and it eats some of the same things as the box turtle, the painted turtle, and the snapping turtle. They all belong to the same animal family. Or you might see a flamingo. That's a bird with longer legs than a heron has. If you do see a flamingo, ask yourself, how is it like a heron? How is it different? Think about color, body shape, size, feathers, eyes, feet, and so on. Some animals you might see in a zoo are from a very cold climate. Try to think of ways they stay warm. The natural habitat for others is the jungle where it is warm. Try to think of ways they keep cool. But you don't have to go far away to find interesting animals to study. You can find them wherever you are, even right outside your door. Like this spider that has just finished spinning its web on the nature hut porch. I'll bet we can find some living thing under almost any rock we turn over here. Oh, look what we have here. This worm-like creature isn't a worm, and it isn't an insect. It's a millipede. Milla means thousand, and pede means feet. A thousand feet? Let's take a closer look at it. Hmm, this millipede doesn't have a thousand feet, but it does have more than most animals. Look at all those legs. Each ring on its body has four legs two on each side. There are too many rings to count, but some millipedes have as many as 30 rings. And 30 times four is 120. Imagine, 120 legs. Naturalists tell us most millipedes are born with only six legs, but as they get older, they grow more rings and more legs. Millipedes use their many legs to crawl and to dig. They crawl under rocks, or into the bark of rotting trees, and they dig tunnels in the earth. Do you think this millipede can see where it's going? Well, it's hard to tell. Some millipedes have eyes, some don't. But they all have short hair-like feelers on their round heads that they probably use to find out what the world around them is like. They use their feelers to find their food, 
the dead plants, leaves, and grass they eat to stay alive. Remember, we call animals that feed on dead plants or animals scavengers. A millipede is a scavenger. What do you think this millipede will do when I put it down? Run away? Hide? Curl up in a ball? Millipedes do all of those things. Let's see what this one will do. There it goes, under that leaf. Let's check out this rotten log. Oh, I see lots of interesting things. Well, the first thing I see is a slug making his way down the log and leaving a bright, slimy trail. And look down here. Here's a tunnel made by an insect. See, it's quite a long one in the sawdust. And here's an even larger hole. That could have been made by, oh, maybe a field mouse. And what do we have here? It's a spotted salamander. Ooh. It looks like a millipede, but it's not. It's a centipede. That means a hundred legs. I have to pick it up carefully. Its first pair of legs, right here behind its head, are used for fighting and biting, not walking and running. I don't want this centipede to use those claws on me. The bite of the centipede can't kill me like it can kill an earthworm, but it can give me a nip. I'll put the centipede back now. And Let's look under this other log. Ah, there's an animal that won't bite. It's a sow bug. Nod your head if you've ever seen one before. Look how its back is rounded and the way its head sits far down on its neck. Somebody once thought this animal looked like a sow. A sow is a mother pig. And that's how the sow bug got its name. The sow bug has another name. It's sometimes called a pill bug. I guess you can see how it got that name. You can find animals to study no matter where you are. Animals are everywhere. For example, would you believe that an insect lives in this foam? When I was a little girl and saw this foam on blades of grass or clover, I called it snake spit. I didn't discover that this was the home of a little green bug until I looked inside. Here it is. This is the nymph of the spittle bug. The foam protects it from its predators until it becomes an adult and has wings and can break out of the foam and fly away. Other insects make other kinds of homes. Just look up there. Some hornets and wasps make this kind of home. If you see one in the woods or in your backyard, don't touch it. Don't go too close. Bees, hornets, and wasps don't like their homes to be disturbed, especially when they're tending to the young in the nest. They can sting. You don't have to live in the country to be able to find animals to study. You can find animals in the city, too. You can find ants in a crack in the sidewalk on a city street. Take time to watch the ants and see what they're doing. Underground, they have a little city all of their own. You'll see sparrows and starlings almost anywhere. They find food to eat and places to live all year round. They don't seem to mind the traffic or crowds of people. Even the parks in the city seem to be crowded with people. City parks are places where you can see different kinds of animals. And if there's a pond, you may see ducks swimming around. Maybe even a seagull.
And then there are squirrels and chipmunks. At this time of year, the squirrels are running around to gather up nuts to store for the winter. Squirrels aren't hibernators, so they need lots of nuts and acorns to keep them alive when the ground is covered with snow and ice. And of course, there are pigeons. Wherever there are people, there are pigeons. People mean food to pigeons. Or your backyard may look like this. You may have rabbits or squirrels or chipmunks or birds right outside your door. You know, you can encourage animals to come by keeping feeders or a bird bath near your home. Or your backyard may not look like any of the places we saw today. Whether it does or not, I hope I've helped you see that you can find interesting animals by yourself almost anywhere. And when you find an animal, I hope you'll remember to ask yourself questions about its size, its shape, and its color. And I hope you'll think about how does it eat? How does it move? How does it protect itself? And how does it make more animals like itself? You will remember to do that, won't you? Well, now, this is the last program in the Up Close and Natural series. Today, we say goodbye to the Science Center, beautiful Squam Lake, and the many animals that live here. They're all interesting animals, but do we really need them? Of what use are chipmunks gathering their nuts for winter? Pigeons looking for food in the grass? Robins hopping across our path? Spiders spinning their webs in sheltered places? Earthworms making their tunnels in our gardens? Or crickets chirping their songs in the summer night? Do we need them? Of course we do. They're all part of the natural world, just as we are. Most animals add beauty, variety, and interest to our lives, and we learn so much from them. I'm glad they're around. It makes me happy just to see them and to study them. I like learning things about the animals that share the world with me, and I hope you do too, and I hope you always will. This program has been produced by New Hampshire Public Television and funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Oh, look, honey, they're showing the red balloon. I love this movie. No, no I don't think so. I'll bet it's a science spot. On balloons? What is there to say about balloons? I'm sure it's the movie. See, it's floating over Paris. Trust me. Yes, it is a science.